In this video, we will see how we can use the impulse response of a system to interpret the transfer function in a new way. So the impulse response is simply the response of the system when uh, the input is given as an impulse or essentially our delta function here. And so what's important is, again, we're not interested in, in the effect of initial conditions, only the effect of the input. And so it's important that this is uh, when the system is at rest. So the response of the system is simply the output y of t that's due to this particular input delta. And so in this case, I'm denoting it by this wiggly blue function that occurs because of this delta function or an impulse that's applied at, zero, at time is equal to zero. And so just to remind you, the delta function is this um, infinitely tall pulse that lasts for an instantaneous amount of time, and it has unit area. So the unit area thing is just simply a mathematical um, notion. And so that way, if we wanted to, we could even put in here, say like a four, and it would be four times the delta function. So if we analyze this uh, using uh, the Laplace domain, then we can recall that the Laplace transform of the impulse or the delta function is simply just one. And so that means that if we have our transfer function relationship between the input u and the output y of s, that the transfer function h of s, um, if we plug in this one into for u of s, that just means that y of s, the response, the impulse response of the system is given by h of s, which is our transfer function. And so this means that another way to interpret our transfer function is simply as the response of the system due to an impulse. The cool thing about defining the impulse response as the transfer function um, is that it generalizes very interestingly. So for example, in this first line, we're taking a look at the situation that we just talked about, that we apply our delta function at time is equal to zero, and that means we get a response, and that response is, I'm writing this as the inverse Laplace of the transfer function h of s. So that's why it's called h of t, but we could also think about that as being y of t. But I'm going to call it h of t because we're going to compose now a more interesting um, uh, response due to multiple shifted delta functions. So one of the characteristics of time invariance is the fact that because our system doesn't explicitly depend on time, if we apply our delta function at time t is equal to a, then the response occurs in the exact same way, the exact same response happens, except that it's shifted over by, uh, by a time a. And in addition, if we were to multiply by a factor of alpha, that means that we would just scale the response by a factor of alpha. And this is due to linearity. And then going one step further, if we apply multiple delta functions at different times, and in this case, I'm going to nicely separate them in steps of delta, that we can write the response as a whole bunch of these shifted responses. So in fact, we get this same response H, but now shifted by different amounts of delta, two delta, three delta, and then scaled by different values. Um, and if I write this, these heights, essentially these heights of each of these, instead of being alphas, I'll just express it as this U, function U, evaluated at these different times delta. And so this is this total, uh, total expression here represents the complete uh, signal that I'm injecting as my input, which means that then the corresponding for each, each one of these pulses, I get the corresponding output given by the scaling that I had before. So this term is exactly the same as this u of k delta. And then the response is just h shifted by the amount of that k delta again. And so if this is the response to each one of them, then the complete response y of t is going to be the sum of all of these responses. And this notion of that the fact that the response is the sum of the individual responses 
to these individual pulses. This is something that you started to see in the second lab where you saw that we could add the responses together and that gave you the response of, an, of the sum of a bunch of inputs. So if we have the sum over all of these different inputs at various k deltas, we can take that delta closer and closer to zero. So this instead, so that effectively means that these deltas are no longer separated by a relatively large range. They're actually stacked right next to each other. And so we can, we can very closely, if we take that delta to zero, we can then represent the, the sum as an integral and the tau represents the shift that we've made. And now these aren't discrete deltas, but actually a continuous function, u of tau. And this is the input that we're going to apply to the system. And this is the response. And what we see here is that by taking delta to zero, we can interpret that the transfer function, h of, h of t, now shifted this response of the impulse, impulse response, shifted and scaled by our input u of t, or in this case u of tau, actually gives us the solution y of t. So this actually tells us that we can compose arbitrary, the response of the system to arbitrary inputs using the impulse response, or also known as the transfer function. So reiterating what I just said is that the transfer function or the impulse response doesn't only provide us um, the response due to an Im impulse, but also to any arbitrary input. And this particular formula here is given a name and it's called the convolution. And it has this special structure where you have essentially one function evaluated in tau and one function that's shifted in tau and t is the variable that we're going to end up with once we integrate over tau. And so we can express, we've just done this for a single block here, we can express z1 in terms of u. And then we can continue that chain by nesting these convolution statements. And so now we can write z1, uh, sorry, z2 in terms of z1, and then y in terms of z2. And what that ends up being is a very nasty um, nested set of integrals. So we said that z2 can be interpreted as the convolution of this transfer function h2 with the input signal z1. And then what I do is I plug in what z1 of tau is. And here what I'm doing is I'm just being careful that when I input z1 of tau, I'm just changing the variables of this integration up here in the first integral such that it's different from this tau. So I've just got to make sure that my, uh, my variables of integration are different. And so here I've used sigma, but in principle, this is exactly the same integral as this. I've just changed out the variables of integration. Now you do that nesting one more time to compose this. So this tells us that we can, using the impulse response or the transfer functions, h1, h2, and h3, we can compose the, the output y of t in terms of only the input u, and then all of these transfer functions. We don't actually have any explicit dependence on these inter intermediate signals. And so in class, we're gonna see how we can actually greatly simplify the mathematics here and that's another uh, great benefit that we get from the Laplace transform. So we're going to see how the Laplace transform actually transforms this super nasty integration into a very simple multiplication.